I see we we refreshed ourselves, Megan, from this morning. <laughs> yes, we were some more gaps here. <laughs> All right. All right, well, hello everyone who's joining us. We'll, we'll get started. Um, I'm Joanna Roach, I'm the Executive Director of GSN Planet. I'm here with Megan uh, Tomasco, who are steady and uh, happy and well-adjusted <laughs> controller of all things, Zoom. So thank you, uh, Megan, for doing this every week. Really appreciate that. Um, and we're also here with Douglas Drummond, who is the Director of Healing Arts and Somatics at Esalen, our very, very um, esteemed partner in this uh, process that we have introduced to our community, which really focuses on the human potential movement and some of the really incredible resources and people who are involved with Esalen Institute. Today, we have Reverend Bodhi with us, and he is going to take us into lesson seven of our series, which is Change Your Life, Prepare for Death, The Teachings of Three Hearts. And I know that Doug is going to give him a better introduction than I, so I will happily turn it over to you, Douglas. <laughs> oh, well, Joanna, you're always gracious as always. Um, but yeah, well, thank you to the GSN community and you know, to the extended community through Wrestling and, and through Reverend Bodie's group too. Um, yeah, always an honor to be able to help curate, you know, these, um, these subjects and bring these uh, people um, nearer and dearer, um, you know, to the field and to the topic. And gosh, um, you know, uh, Reverend Bodhi definitely bring a very, uh, for me especially in our time or my time um, living in, in Maui and Hawaii and uh, curating some absolutely exquisite standout events um, around the, the umbrella of death and dying. Um, and uh, so interesting when you go into a process of curating and putting uh, an event or a project together where you get to see your own reflection and how you relate to this. And uh, Reverend Bodhi's been uh, a real pivotal, I say, teacher you know, and friend of mine too to help uh, get some uh, retrospect insight um, into what death and dying is all about. And perhaps uh, one path or many paths one goes down to understand it and realizing that it's quite a kaleidoscope of experience. Um, and Reverend Bodhi brings incredibly uh, passionate, um, a high integrity, um, you know, a, a well, a well learned and, um, and deeply committed approach to the subject material. So I'm, I'm super grateful and so touched, you know, that you're here, Bodhi, um, and um, to be able to share some of these lessons, which is um, a very apparent and um, it's a definite. If there were things, uh, what is what is constant in our lives will change certainly, and death is definitely one of them. Um, so thank you for approaching the subject with such grace that you do, uh, Reverend Bodhi, and um, and the floor is yours, my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you, Douglas, and thanks for the opportunity. I think before we start, uh, let's let's stop together. And if you'd let me guide you a little bit, and if you'd like, close your eyes and imagine that you're standing uh, in the most beautiful place you know in nature. Maybe you have a favorite place in nature. And, and stand there for a moment and look around and, and feel your feet on the ground and feel yourself in that beautiful place in nature. Take a few breaths, settle down. We've taken our whole lives to get to this very moment. There's no coincidence that we're all here in this moment. We've all taken our whole lives to get right here, right now. And as you're standing in nature, uh, notice in the distance there's a meadow and start to walk towards the meadow and walk into the meadow and as you walk into the meadow, notice that everyone else on this uh, call, you see them all uh, walking towards a central point under a big, beautiful white circus tent on the grass in the meadow. And just before you enter into the tent, stop and remember why you're here, why you joined this uh, group today, what's most important to you, and settle down a little bit. and step into the tent, step onto the grass in the middle of the tent, and stand in a circle with everyone here today. And again, feel your feet on the grass. See if you can feel the air touching your skin. 
look around at the beauty of the sky outside the tent, the lush green grass, the beautiful people around you, and start to really let go. Drop down, let your out breath really be a release that you just let go, let go of your roles in the world, your jobs, your concepts. See if you're willing to just for now, let go of your beliefs and your concepts. You can hang them up on a corner of the tent. They'll be there for you if you want them when you leave. And get in touch with how you're actually feeling right now. If there's any anxiety for what's happening in the world or what's happening in your life. Is there any grief? So many of us are grieving what's happening in the world, what's happening in this country, what's happening to nature and the rest of creation. Those of us that have grandchildren, I, I think are even more sensitive to our, our own grieving in terms of the world that appears to be coming. And so we let down and we let go and we willing we we be willing to be fresh in the moment, here and now in this time that we have together. People ask me how are you doing, Bodhi, and I I say, I'm having the time of my life. As it turns out, that's exactly what we're having, every one of us, the time of our life. So I'd like to start by showing you an image as you open your eyes and join us all here and look around. And the image, let's see, it doesn't look like that image happened. Is there an image on the screen now? No. Nope. Yeah, maybe I do need to yeah, be in can. speaker yeah. view. Yeah, try that. Let's try it again. No, for some reason I'm not able to. Uh, let's try it again. Nope. 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 Let's try it one more time and then we'll move on. Okay. There we go. Yay, third time. Now let me find it on my screen. So now you're looking at two, at two lines. The top line, which runs from the edge of the paper to the other edge of the paper, is life itself. Or a certain, a certain notion of life as a, as a line which is really only one version of time. And on the line below it, there's an X on each end of the line, and that's your life. And what I'd like you to do in this moment is imagine putting an X on where you think you are on this line. It shouldn't take you too long. Where are you in your, in your life in terms of your lifeline? Okay, I'm guessing you've all done that by now. And uh, maybe, maybe in looking at where you put your X, maybe some thoughts or feelings come up in terms of where you are or where you imagine yourself to be on that line. Uh, uh, many times now I've been in a room with about a hundred people, uh, many of them doctors and nurses and social workers and hospice people and healers and artists and, and, and regular lay people. And I, and I ask everybody, will you raise your hand if you know you're going to die and you don't know when? And 100 people pretty much all raise their hands and look at me like, that's a silly question. Everybody knows that. Well, the truth of the matter is most everybody knows that in their heads, but it's not an embodied, realized experience. It's not, it's not true in a cellular, embodied, realized way. And I know that because I look around at not only my life, but I watch people and, and it's obvious to me that most people are not living like it's true. 
that we're going to die and we don't know when. And everyone we love and care about are going to die and we don't know when. And that to me is uh, maybe one of the biggest elephants in the room that we think we have more time, whatever it is, however close you were to the end of your lifeline, that we imagine we have more time. And in imagining we have more time, we do a tremendous disservice to ourselves and the people around us. That when you stop imagining that you have more time and the people that you love and care about have more time, your life changes in radical, in radical, big and powerful ways, beautiful ways. For one thing, you stop procrastinating. For another, you stop being lazy unless you want to be lazy. I love to be lazy when I choose to be lazy and I'm actually really good at it. We stop being lazy, we stop procrastinating. We start to consider, do we love our life? Do we love our partners? Do we love our careers and jobs? Are we living on purpose? What's most important? What's most important? And for most people, what's more, most important are our relationships, our connection to the people we love and care about. And oftentimes that's the last thing people want to lose when they're dying, is the ability to receive and give love. This entitlement that we deserve 80 years, more or less, it, it's peculiar to a particular culture that most of us live in. And we wake up every morning assuming that of course we're gonna wake up because we have 80 years, whatever, whatever your number is. Uh, oftentimes it's, it's at least the number where one of your parents died. And that sense of entitlement is tremendously harming to us and the people and the planet around us. And where it shows up so often is when a child dies. Oh, I'm so sorry that child didn't get to live a full life. And that's inherent in that entitlement that we imagine a full life is 80 years and anything less than that is a ripoff. And so we wake up entitled to wake up. Of course, we're going to wake up every day, even though many people went to bed last night, not knowing that they wouldn't wake up this morning, that we take it for granted, that we think we have more time. And in not and thinking we have more time, we don't fully show up. We don't bring our AAA game to this very moment. And I can imagine that so many of you have had the experience of, I wish that wasn't the last time I saw somebody, or I, that was the last time I spoke to that person. Wishing that wasn't the case and we could see them or speak to them one more time. I, I know I do. I have some uh, uh, painful experiences wishing that wasn't the last time I spoke to that person. And imagine if the next time you're standing in front of somebody, you live in that realization and that truth and that rawness of, this may be the last time I speak to this person or look at this person. What do you bring to that moment that maybe you're not bringing to it right now? Really, it's every moment. If we're going to die and we don't know when, and the people we love and care about are going to die and we don't know when, how do we meet the next moment? Now, that's a very big question. That's a very big question because in the truth that we're going to die and we don't know when, how do we dance and fool around and play and goof off and have a good time? in the truth of we're going to die and we don't know when. And that's a beautiful question, how to, how to live completely fully alive, fully embodied, showing up, showing up all the way, here and now. Uh, God said to Moses, he named me. Uh, no, he said, actually, I'm sorry, God said to Moses, where are you? Moses said, he nay nay. He said the same thing to Abraham. Where are you, Abraham? What, you know, what's up? And Abraham said, he nay nay, which is, I am here. Right? I am fully here. I am listening. I am present. 
I am alive in this moment, I'm not leaving anything on the table. So the most known thing, maybe the most known thing that, that we're going to die and we don't know when, somehow seems to be the, one of the least known things about. And, and when we bother to even touch it, uh, we have some funny beliefs about the whole, the whole, that whole realm of, you see, death itself has been diminished and, and to such a degree that death, dying with dignity and dying well is real work because of what we've done to death and how we've pushed it off the dining room table. It's not in the community conversation. You don't see it at the mall. People aren't talking about it all the time. I mean, maybe they are, maybe you are, right? We have a death store here on Maui. You don't see anything in terms of a death at the mall, except Halloween time or some kind of macabre, um, et cetera. And it wants to be in that community conversation because there is no life without death. No matter what you eat in your diet, things had to die for those plants to grow. And it's not just dirt, it's all the animals and bones and everything else that has died, that is in the earth, that feeds life, that feeds life. Just as the ancestors are feeding us, whether we know it or not. And so when I ask those hundred people, when do you start to die? And 90 people at least say, when you're born, Again, that's a very harming um, understanding. I know some of it comes from a, a Buddhist teaching, but it's really not true in the dying that we're talking about here. Right? You wouldn't say to a newborn babe's mom, what a beautiful baby, too bad it's already dying. We're not dying. Dying people are doing something we're not doing. And, and, and where it can be most harmful is if somebody you know is dying and you have this notion or belief or un, unconscious belief that what's the big deal? We're all dying. No, we're not all dying. Dying people are doing something we're not doing. And so sitting with dying people and sitting with their families and seeing what dying, the work that dying people need to do and end up doing um, and there's work to be done to die well if you want to die well and we don't have a lot of good um, examples or models of what dying well looks like but mostly what we have are the horror stories so now i think i'll just head to the uh, three teachings and um of the heart three hearts so I'm going to come out of that and I'm going to come to trying to jam uh, six months worth of teachings into 35 minutes. Teachings of the three hearts. And this is really um, based on what I see as the work of dying well. And in fact, the work of dying well starts today because we really don't want to leave this work to when we're on our deathbed. It's way harder to do this work uh, if you're in pain, if you're heavily medicated, um, et cetera. So the three hearts. The first heart is the physical heart. It's the heart that's beating inside your chest right now. And if you put your hand on it, you can feel it. And it's been beating since before you were born. The first heartbeat you ever heard was your mother's. And then your heart started to beat in a polyrhythm with your mother's. So that you heard your own heart and your mother's heart. And this heart represents your physical body. What is your relationship to your physical body? We spend so much time loving it, hating it. Uh, beautifying it, uh, feeding it, 
uh, caring for it. You know, what is our relationship to our body and how well do we take care of our body? And, 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 and do we think this body is just some separate thing, just some vehicle, I'm not my body? I used to say we're not the body. I don't say that anymore. I've been around too many dead people uh, to say we're not the body. It's clear to me that we are the body, but we're not just the body. And, and it's beautiful to witness when the spirit uh, actually leaves the body. And I see the way people want to honor that body. So of course we know, we know by now what it means to take care of the physical body, right? That's out there. We all, we all know that whether we live it or not, we know what it means to take care of the physical body in terms of food, exercise, uh, managing stress, living a good life, taking care of the body, this vehicle, this temple, temple of the holy itself, this beautiful gift that is way more advanced than any computer they've come up with. It's amazing the, the things it does in any given moment and that it keeps on doing them whether we think about them or not. What a powerful, precious gift we've been given, this body. So that's the physical heart. The second heart is the emotional heart. The emotional heart are our feelings, you know. Everything from love and anger and anxiety and grief and sorrow, on and on and on. It's how we are deeply feeling people. And we are deeply empathetic people and naturally compassionate people, especially compassionate when we let go of fear and judgment. We have really deep hearts. And many of us are, most of us, I would say, are too sensitive for this world and somehow in some ways protect ourselves from the intensity of this world. We all have a trail. We're leaving a trail constantly behind us. And that trail is filled with love and gratitude and appreciation and respect and joy and community and friendship. And also many of us have potholes on that trail, resentment, unfinished business, anger, you know what I'm talking about. Somebody maybe you're still not clear with, but you know, you know it's there. And sure enough, when you're on your deathbed, I see all of that showing up. And that's why uh, someone dying will ask, uh, pray and plead for their son 6,000 miles away to fly in so that they can say thank you, or I love you, or I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. It's all right there. It's all right there. We walk around with that, that trail and continue to make that trail. Again, this is why it's so important to do this work now. You know, it's like cramming for the college exams the night before. And maybe a number of you did that and, and flew right through it. But when you're dying and in pain and maybe heavily medicated, and looking at your approaching death, it's harder to do this work. And it's the work of cleansing the heart. It's the work of bringing ourselves freshly into this moment. It's the work of letting go of all the ways we're holding on. We're holding on to our sense of who we are. We're holding on to this sense of what's happening out here as if we know what's happening out here. The illusion of thinking we know what's going on. You know, we are mostly grief illiterate in this culture and to find our way into learning that love and grief are really the same, they're twins. That we grieve what we've loved and what we love and we grieve what we care about. We grieve what we love. And that happens, I see families grieving and a dying person grieving long before the dying person has died. 
that there was already grief around the dying. One of the most common, in fact, one of the leading causes de of death in this country is congestive heart failure, heart disease. That's not just a physical thing. There is no such thing as just a physical thing, except maybe a broken arm. How many of us have congested hearts? Because we are unwilling to truly and deeply feel what we're feeling. How many of us stay just too busy to stop and feel where we're hurting, feel where we're grieving? And uh, Chogyam Rinpoche says there's two kinds of laziness. Uh, one kind of laziness is uh, being is these uh, men in India that sit around drinking tea all day while the women do the work and they just talk story, and hang out. And then there's Western laziness where we're so busy doing all this important stuff that we never really get to the most important stuff. And so many of us are just too busy to stop and touch on what's most important. And we have to see where we're armoring ourselves. Maybe we were hurt so terribly, deeply, that we decided we'd never allow ourselves to be that hurt again. And so we've somehow armored ourselves to it and avoided touching the heart. And of course, when you armor your heart, and not only do you not allow the love in, but you keep the love from coming out. And so we see old, not, not always old, but we see old, bitter people because they protected themselves from ever feeling that pain again. And by now, probably all of us have had our hearts broken. How beautiful. How beautiful. Maybe the biggest work we do is how to, how to live and love with a broken heart. And then the third heart is the spiritual heart. And we all have the spiritual heart because we're all deeply connected in the holy itself living inside each one of us. It doesn't just live in the heart. The soul is immersed, permeating every part of who we are, our minds, our hearts, our cells. But the holiness itself, unblemished and untouched, is constantly here, revealing itself to us when we listen. So what is a congested spiritual heart? Are we really working at connecting deepening our connection as a real relationship to the holy, whatever you call it. But if you call it God or love or um, keakua in Hawaii, you know, whatever you call it, it doesn't matter what you call it. It's what matters is that you call it and that you have a living, alive relationship that's true and real. And that becomes even more essential when we see everything outside of ourselves is changing. What do we hold on to out here in the world when everything is changing and so many things are breaking down and dying? And ma many of these things that are dying need to die. So many of these systems that are causing so much harm, so much poverty and injustice in this world are breaking down and need to break down. So what, what do we stand on? You know, what is our life raft? How do we become a ladder and a life, a lifeboat and a lamp for everyone else, really? That's our connection to the holy. That is real and that is true. And so we do what, do what we need to do to un uncongest where we can mouth the words of the spiritual materialistic uh, jargon, you know, the bumper stickers. That's not going to hold up when you find out you're dying. It doesn't matter what book or what bumper sticker, or what new age aphorism is your particular view. It's not going to matter. What's going to matter is, is it real? Is it true? Does it show up for you in your daily life? 
And so the work of the three hearts is to clean and cleanse and purify and beautify and become a light and a lamp and a lifeboat and a ladder to the people around you. So we give thanks to all those people that have uh, shown up for us in our lives, our teachers, our parents, our, and, and, and whatever relationship you have with your parents, uh, they contributed uh, to who you are right now. And the ancestors are praying for us. Absolutely, I'm sure of it. Um, uh, I see uh, that one, one, one part of what happens to us which a number of cultures subscribe to is that uh, when we die, we sit around the, the fire with all our friends and loved ones and tell stories and laugh and tell jokes. And then we look down here and see if any of our people need our help and our prayers. And then we pray. We pray for those people down there. Those people are praying for us right now. And maybe way back, way, way, way back, when our people were nomads on the trail, when life surely was harder than it is now for us. We have it so, as hard as it is for you, we've got it so easy. And imagine your ancestors walking on that trail, following the herd, and one of, one of your ancestors just stopped and said, I can't go on, this is too hard, this is too painful, it's not worth it, this is just too hard. I'm gonna sit down on the side of the trail, I'm not going on, I'm gonna die. And one of your ancestors maybe did exactly that. But before they died, they saw us. I got chicken skin just saying that. And they saw us and seeing who we are and who we've become and the life we live. And even though they were living a tremendously painful and hard and difficult life, seeing us was enough for them to get up and keep going. And I can hear, I can hear now, every now and then, my grandchildren's grandchildren's grandchildren. And they're calling me, Bodie, in the midst of the madness, in the midst of the injustice, and the horrible poverty, the ill treatment of so many people, in the destruction and the wanton destruction of the earth and all its creatures in the midst of all of that when the world was on fire grandpa what were you doing and now i live in response to that question to be a lamp to be a ladder to be a lifeboat So we're somewhere near the end of this, and I was uh, encouraged to see if there were any questions, um, but certainly I could go on. So until I hear that there's a question, I'll go on, and I'll tell you about the work I do to reinvent and really revolutionize how we approach our dying how we care for the dying and how we care for the dead. And how, and how uh, I work to educate people to wake up to the truth that we may not have a lot of time. And how that oftentimes is the most powerful spiritual experience. So it certainly is when you find out somebody close to you has died or somebody close to you found out they're dying for almost all of us, something happens to us that shakes us out of the cultural sleepwalk and shakes us into the fragility and preciousness and rawness where there isn't any room for any bullshit. That's a powerful spiritual experience, shaking us into the present moment time, into the preciousness, into how precious and fragile it is. 
because otherwise by default, so many of us fall into that cultural sleepwalk, that hypnotic, um, everything's, everything's okay somehow. So I challenge myself and I challenge you to bring yourself fully alive in the truth that we're going to die and we don't know when. I think that that understanding is the source of all creativity, that nothing is going to last in this life. Question for you, Bodhi. You know, when you have, when you ask, you ask yourself that question, um, you know, what am I doing now? If this was my last uh, moment or um, feeling that impermanence and one is not feeling happy with what they're doing and it is a big, well, a uh, big moment, you know, how do you tactfully approach that moment um, to kind of consider all options or give yourself that kind of grace and compassion? Um, maybe more specific, you're in a job, for instance, and you realize, you know what, this is not my life, fulfilling my life's work, um, which I had that experience, which I shared with you one time, and we make that massive decision while we are changing and upheaval, um, and uh, it's challenging, but I know I needed some support with that. Um, what could you share about that? Great question, you know, great question. And, and the recognition to be able to stop and touch into what we really feel about our job, about our life, about our marriage, about it, all of it. I mean, that's the biggest step right there to be willing to feel it and look at it with real self-awareness, with, with real self-inquiry, without self-judgment, without blame. I mean, we are tough on ourselves, tougher than anybody, without self-criticism, but to recognize that here we are and we took our whole lives to get here. In fact, maybe we took lifetimes to get here. So that recognition and that realization that we may not have as much time as we think and we're not living on purpose. We're not living true or fully. Well, that's the beginning of, um, I would say, asking good questions. How do I move towards purpose? How do I find out what that is? You know, vocation, which turned, uh, turned into kind of like going to trade school or something. But vocation actually at the heart of vocation is voca, which is the call. Vocation actually is our true calling. So asking, asking good questions, I think, are so powerful to, uh, once, we, once we've made the giant leap to be willing to consider that we may not have time and I want to live on purpose, then, then helping someone ask a good question in terms of how do we find purpose? You know, what do you love? What do you love to do more than anything, well, you know? You know, when young people ask me, you know, well, you know, how, what to do, how, you know, how do you move through this? I say, what do you love to do? You know, what just lights you up? And I say, well, find out where what you love and lights you up meets what the world needs right now. And everywhere you look, um, you'll get an answer. Thank you. Another question has come up there, Bodhi, is... Um, how do you deal with the thought that your loved ones may die one day? And that, I, you know, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, when my kids, my kids are in their 30s and 40s now, but when they were teenagers and I was living in that sensitivity in that fragile place, uh, my son would go, okay, I'm going surfing, Dad, I'll catch you later. And my daughters would go, hey, we're going out. We're going to go hang with our friends. And I would grab them before they went and I would just wrap my arms around them. I love you so much. I just want you to know I love you so much. I'm so sorry. I'm such a lousy dad. Uh, please forgive me. I just love you, love you, love you. And then then I just, I, you know, that would be it. And then after a week or two, my kids came to me and said, will you just leave us alone? We're just going out. Just leave us alone. And of course I had to leave them alone. But you know, in that sensitivity, I mean, we know when something changes, we don't get an advance notice. And oftentimes we just get the phone call, you know? So how do you live in that sensitivity, but you know, not push your kids away by wanting to squeeze them all the time, every time they want to go off to hang out? That's a, that's a, it's a, that's a powerful question. You know, how do you live your life in that sensitivity and that truth? I mean, if I'm gonna die and I don't know when, 
you know, you know, if we're going to die and we don't know when, why would it be a surprise to find out we're dying? Why would that come as a shock to us? And yet at the same time, as I mentioned before, how do we keep dancing and having a good time and goofing off and, and, uh, but, you know, uh, but, but I am answering that question and I'm so fortunate that uh, my calling has found me and what I'm doing makes sense at a time when so little makes sense. Mm -hmm. Another question from the group. Um, I have a friend who is terminally ill, prefaces every conversation we have with, I do not want to talk about it, meaning death, end of life planning, etc. We have always talked about everything, but she has closed our open conversations. And I struggle with this change and how we communicate. I, people used to come to me with that very thing, and I, I'd come up with these strategies for breaking through somebody's denial. I don't do that anymore. Uh, I just come, I say, and what, what I recommend is that you completely accept that person and, and love that person as best you can. In fact, the question, the question uh, what does love look like in this moment, is always, a, is always a good question if you're not sure uh, what to do. And, and I, I don't try to pull somebody out of denial. If that's the best that they can come up with in that moment, uh, what's going to help them themselves step out of denial is to be completely accepted and loved. And maybe they will and maybe they won't, and, but that's their journey, not yours. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Another question. Um, thank you for this. How do you approach a loved one who has a serious diagnosis and failing health? but doesn't want to let go of the illusion of having more time? Again, I think that's the same question. You know, how do, how do, how do you love somebody uh, completely in their, in their denial and avoidance? Um, you know, how do you show up for suffering? You know, and how you show up for suffering really is your own understanding of, is there value in suffering? And I would say oftentimes there is, and that people have their own journeys and the best you can do is companion them and love them. Mm -hmm. You know, certainly, <clears throat> cer um, excuse me, certainly, I mean, uh, sometimes, you know, I, I want to ask a question that might help break through uh, that wall of denial. They know they're dying uh, oftentimes. Some part of them knows they're dying. It's too yeah. scary to touch. Yeah. You know, and, and, and in recognizing uh, it's too scary then of course our heart goes out to them that they they're that afraid mm. we might be there ourselves mm. well for those that are near near to the end at the top of the hour um reverend Bodhi, thank you so much for your time and i'm going to take a few deep breaths and you know i have the privilege and luxury of being able to be at esalen and have a walk down to the near, near the water's edge and take some deep breaths um, of contemplation and real gratitude for you and for the group that's gathered to listen to this and May it reverberate far and wide. Thank you so much, um, Joanne. I don't know if you have any closing remarks, but um, for absolute sincere gratitude and thank you to you on call. And um, thank you again, Reverend Bodhi. Absolute, absolute pleasure to have you here. Yes, uh, I, I mean I echo what Douglas is saying. That was amazing. Um, I was taking some notes. Uh, that was really just a remarkable um, conversation that you shared with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Amazing work. Well, yeah. have a beautiful rest of your day and yes. uh, we'll uh, tune in next in a couple of weeks. Thanks again. Yes, thank you so much. Thank, thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate that. Thank you uh -huh. for sharing uh -huh. yourself with us. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh.